Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different aspects of the enzymes in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the history of the development of enzymology. Then we, uh, in the previous module, we have discussed about the structure of the enzymes and how we can be able to determine the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structures. And if you recall in this particular module, we are discussing about how you can be able to isolate the gene of your interest so that you can be able to use that gene to clone it into a suitable vector and that can be used for the protein production or the enzyme production. So if you, uh, if you recall in this particular in the previous two lectures, we have discussed about the two approaches. In approach one, we have said that you are we are going to prepare a genomic library so that the library is going to represent the every gene in that particular in the form of the clones. And then um, uh, you can use the different screening method to isolate the gene of your interest. The alternate approach is that you can actually be able to prepare the cDNA library. And cDNA library is going to represent the expression status of that particular cell. So, and then uh, you can be able to uh, screen the cDNA library with the help of the antibodies or the enzymatic method. And you can also use the DNA as a probe as well to screen the cDNA library. And that's how ultimately you are going to get the gene of your interest. And then you can isolate the gene of interest from the, uh, from the library and then you can use that for uh, cloning into the uh, suitable vector so that you can be able to use that for uh, protein production or the enzyme production. These are the approaches when people uh, is uh, very popular when people were not having the information about the genes or the genomic sequences. So before the people uh, pre-genomic era when the people were not aware of the genomic sequences the uh, utilization or the exploitation of the genomic library or the theta library was very, very popular. But now, since the, we normally, we, most of the time we normally use, uh, we, we know the genomic sequence of the uh, organisms. So we can be able to use the straightforward uh, approach and that is called as the polymerase chain reaction. So we can actually be able to amplify the gene with the help of the polymerase chain reactions and that's how you can be able to use that amplified product and you can clone it into the vector and that's how you can be able to uh, get the uh, purified enzyme. So in today's lecture we are going to use and we are going to discuss about the polymerase chain reaction. So uh, these are things we have already discussed. We have discussed about when the genomic sequence is not, uh, when the genomic sequence is known or the approaches when you are going to use the gene, gene sequence is known. So in the, when the gene sequence is known, that is the approach number two, uh, you are going to take the genomic sequence, you are going to design the uh, site specific uh, primers and uh, that's how you are actually going to get the, uh, you are going to perform the polymerase chain reaction and that is actually going to give you the amplified product and that's how this amplified product can be cloned into a suitable vector and that you can be able to use for the, uh, you know, for the enzyme production. So now the first question comes, what is the polymerase chain reactions? So polymerase chain reaction is are the reactions which are actually going to help you to amplify a double standard DNA with the same size and as the sequence by the enzymatic method and the cyclic conditions. So what is polymerase chain reaction? Polymerase chain reaction is to amplify a lot of double standard DNA molecules with the same uh, size and the sequence by the enzymatic method and the cycling. So for example, if this is the template DNA, then uh, the, with the help of the polymerase chain reaction, you can actually be able to make the multiple copies of the template DNA. Like this is the copy number one, two, three, four. And all these four copies are actually going to be identical in terms of the sequence and as well as in terms of the size. So uh, how you are going to achieve this? You are going to achieve this because the DNA is a very unique molecule and DNA itself provides you the information and as well as the uh, tools to perform this particular task. So what is DNA? DNA is a 
nucleic acid that is composed of the two complementary nucleotide building blocks chains right you know that the dna is double helix and it is made up of of the nucleotides and the nucleotides that are made up of of the phosphate group a five membered carbon uh, sugar and a nitrogen base which means a nucleotide is consist of the five member sugar right and the sugar is attached on one side it is attached to the base and on the other side it is actually attached to the phosphate group and this uh, is actually going to help in formation of the uh, dna so you are actually going to have the different types of nucleotides which are actually going to be responsible for the dna formation uh, so dna has the four nitrogenous bases you have the two purine bases which are called two rings bases these are called adenine and guanine you have the two pyrimidines so these are called cytosine and thiamine and these four bases are linked in a repeated pattern by a hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases the linking of the two complementary strand is called as the hybridization and i'm sure you all know that there is a strict base pairing between the uh, purines and pyrimidines and that's why uh, a is always making a pair with t with the help of the two hydrogen bonding whereas g is making a, a pair with C with the three hydrogen bonding. So every purine is making a bond with the uh, pyrimidine and uh, so uh, because of this particular unique character of the DNA molecule, the molecules can be complementary to each other which means if you have a sequence on one strand, uh, for example if you are having a strand from 5 prime to 3 prime, the second strand is actually going to be uh, predicted based on this base pairing information. So DNA is complementary in nature, right? So if you can, you can have the primary strand. So this is going to be running strand. Suppose you can imagine that this is a template strand. So this is a, if this is a template strand, this is going to be the complementary strand. So wherever you have the G, it is going to have C and wherever you have the C, it is going to have the G. Wherever you have T, it's going to have A. And wherever you have A, it is going to have the T, which means uh, wherever you have A, it is actually going to have T. And wherever you have G, it is actually going to have C because the A and T and G and C are having the strict relationship or strict base pairing uh, information. So what we are supposed to do is you are going to have the primary strands right available and then you are only you have to generate the complementary strand. This means you are looking for a machinery which actually be able to perform this particular task. So what this machinery is going to do is it is actually going to read the template strand and so it is going to read the template strand right and then it is actually going to uh, bring the nucleotides to synthesize complementary strand okay so this is what you are supposed to do right and this machinery uh, is readily available in the biological system you remember that we when we when the dna is replicated it's actually going to be perform uh, you utilize this particular machinery for replications so taking the uh, inspiration from the biological system right people have also discovered the machinery which can be used under the in vitro conditions so if you see the biological machinery biological machinery has the different components you have the helicases you have the primase you have the ssb proteins you have the dna polymerase and then you also have the teeth ring proteins and all of these machine uh, proteins uh, which are part of the machinery are having the designated specific role for example helicases helicases are going to separate the two strand because you know the dna is double standard and it is connected to each other so in the step one you are actually going to make the two strands separate so that the base pairs are ready and these base pair once these base pair are exposed then only the you know dna polymerase can be able to read this information and that's how it can be able to synthesize the complementary strand right then you have the primase so the purpose of the primase is to synthesize the rna primer because the dna polymerase cannot start from the nascent chain so it requires a, a partially double bond structure so that it can be able to use that information and then extend the uh, dna strands then you require the ssb proteins so ssb proteins are the protein which actually will uh, prevent the re of the single standard dna this means all these 
because once you once the helicase is going to generate the single standard dna the single standard dna will automatically will come and bind to each other so that's why the single standard proteins are actually going to sit on top of this so that it will not allow the nucleotides to interact with each other and that's how they are actually going to prevent the reannealing of the single strands then you require the enzyme the dna polymerase which actually going to read these sequences and that's how it is actually going to start the synthesis of the new strands and then you also require a t3 protein which actually going to stabilize the polymerases so in taking the inspiration from the biological system people have also started designing the uh, in vitro reactions so that you can be able to perform the same task without utilizing the so many different types of enzyme because coordinating these enzymes in, within the cell is a very very easy task because you have lot of you know regulatory proteins and all other things so that you can be able to regulate the activity of helicase primase and ssbs and dna polymerase as well but when you are trying to do this in the in vitro reactions uh, it is very difficult to do that and that's why you have to uh, you know bring the machinery in such a way that you can actually be able to replace some of these functions so ideally if you want to do a cna synthesis under the in vitro conditions what you are going to do is you are going to have to perform these three steps under the uh, in a repeated manner right so after this termination you are again going to do this and then again doing like this okay so this uh, you have to do in a cyclic manner so initiation you are going to prepare the dna for synthesis which means you are going to break these strands right so strands Uh, you have to break these strands so that you are going to get the single uh, dna strand so in the step 1 you are going to bring the single dna strands right then you are going to bring the uh, dna polymerase and it is actually going to give start the synthesis so that is going to start the synthesis and in the step 3 you are going to stop the uh, dna synthesis okay so these uh, task were achieved not in a single day but there was a concerted or there are lot of uh, efforts people have made then only they could be able to get to the machinery which actually can be able to perform these task so these are the historical development in which the uh, the pcr is being developed so there are different events in the development of pcr for example in the year of 1950 the people uh, uh, the author conberg actually discovered the dna replication and that's how we could be able to know that what are the different proteins are involved and how the dna polymerase is synthesizing the dna so he actually discovered the dna polymerase and uh, helicases and primers and that's how we know that there is a you know all these enzymes are involved then in the year of 1976 the the thermostable dna polymerase from the thermus equitus was discovered which is called as tag dna polymerase and uh, and then uh, in the year of 1983 the carey mullers synthesized the dna oligos probe for the sickle cell anemia mutations and in the same year um uh, repeated thermal cycling was first used for small segment of the cloned gene and that's how the people have this thought that maybe we can do the repeated cycling and that's how we can be able to amplify the small stretches of dna and in the year of 1984 the carey mullers and tom white tried the different ex uh, designed experiment to test the pcr on the genomic dna but the amplified product was not visible in the agrochel because because of the simple reason that the efficiency was not very high then in the year of 1985 the patent was filed to the pcr and application focusing on the sickle cell anemia mutations and in the year of 1985 the use of thermostable dna polymerase in pcr was started out of only two enzyme tag dna polymerase and bst known at the time so tag was found more suitable for the pcr because what will happen is when you go for this thermal cycling uh, it actually denatures the enzyme so that's how you have to keep adding the enzyme every reaction every cycle so when we people have discovered the tag dna polymerase the, that uh, problem was been overcome then in the year of 1985 the pcr techniques uh, was discovered and then in the year of 1985 to 87 people have also discovered the thermal cyclers 
So in a typical PCR, what happens is that PCR is a repeated cycling reaction that involves a mechanism of DNA replication. It results in the production of multiple copies of DNA from a single one. The whole process involves three main events, denaturation, annealing and elongations. So denaturation is the first step, uh, which is actually very close to as initiation step. Then annealing where the primers are going to anneal and then the DNA synthesis will start. So that will be, and then we are also going to have elongation. Uh, DNA a fragment of interest is used as a template from which a pair of primers or a short oligonucleotide complementary to both the DNA strands are made to prime the DNA synthesis where the direction of the synthesis or the extension is from 5 prime to 3 prime as in a DNA application the number of amplified DNA or the amplicon increases exponentially per cycle thus one molecule of DNA will give rise to 2, 4, 6, 15 and so forth. And if you want to calculate the amount of amplified DNA, you can actually be able to use this formula. Uh, so what happened is that it started with a single template. So you have a single template in the step one, there will be a denaturation. So denaturation is actually going to separate out the template and so you're going to get the two in a single strands, right? And uh, once the single strands is there, then uh, you are going to allow the you know you lower down the temperature so that's how you are going to allow the binding of the primers and once the primer is bound the DNA polymerase will sit and it is actually going to synthesize the second strands so for one template you are going to get two fragments and from the two on the two fragments you are going to have the synthesis of the strands so this means you started with the one fragment and now you're going to have the two fragments so at the end of the two cycle, you're going to have the two fragments, one of this and one of this. Now in the second cycle, this one is also going to serve as a template. This one is also going to serve as a template. And that's how you're going to have the four uh, molecules which are going to be synthesized. And that's how in the third cycle, you're going to have the eight, what is going to be synthesized and so on. So this is actually going to give you the exponentially increasing number. And that's how the uh, the amplification is going to be very high in few reactions. How you're going to perform the PCR reactions? So you're going to set up the PCR in the following steps, right? Uh, first is you're going to have the initial denaturation. So this is the initial denaturation in the stage one, right? And initial denaturation, you're going to heat the PCR mixture at 94 to 96 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes to ensure the complete denaturation of the template DNA, which means you're going to have the two separate strands. Then you are going to have the initial, so initial first step is the initial denaturation. In the stage two, you're going to have three events uh, in denaturation, annealing and elongation. So in the denaturation, this is the first step in which the double standard DNA template is denatured to form the two single standard DNA by heating at 95 to 50 to 30 seconds. And then you are going to have the annealing step. So at, at this stage, you are going to have the temperature at 95 degrees Celsius and then you will going to lower down the temperature at 90, 56 degrees Celsius. So this is the annealing temperature where the lower temperature uh, will usually allow the primers are allowed to bind to template DNA and annealing temperature is 15 to 30 seconds and it depends on the length and the basis of the primers. So uh, and then after this you are again going to increase the temperature so you are going to enter the into the elongation phase. So this is the synthesis step where the polymerase is going to perform the synthesis of new strand in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime using the primers and the DNTPs what you are going to add into the reactions. And average DNA polymerase adds about 1000 basis per minute. So you can actually be able to cal calculate. So taking this into account, like when you are adding the 100 base pair per minute, uh, you can be able to calculate what is the elongation time. So suppose you are working with a, with, with, with a gene, which is uh, 2.5 KB, that means uh, 2500 base pair. So you can actually be able to keep the annealing temperature as 2.5 minutes or 2 minutes 30 seconds. Uh, so after this, you're going to have the final elongation. So in the stage three, you're going to have a final elongation. So after the cycles are complete, the reaction is held at 70 to 74 degrees Celsius for several minutes to allow the final extension. And then you're going to have the final hold, which means the final hold at four degrees. 
So these are the these are the things what you have to set up on the PCR machines so that you can be able to perform the reaction. So these machines are called as the uh, thermal cycler, right? And uh, in a typical thermal cycler, you are going to have the uh, you know you can have the flexibility of uh, varying the temperature. Uh, then we are going so these are the yeah, cycles what you are going to do first is in the stage one you are going to have the 95 degree celsius for five minutes and then this these are the things what are going to repeat it for 30 cycles so um, so in each cycle the molecules are going to be amplified exponentially and that's how it is actually going to give you the amplified product and then this is going to be the final uh, elongations and then once the final elongation is over then you can re keep the reaction at 4 degrees so that it should not have the any kind of degradations. Now if you want to perform the PCR what are the different um, products what required? So what are the requirements? You require a sequence, DNA sequence of the target region is known so that is going to give you the template so you should know the information about the template from where you are going to do the amplifications then you require to have the primer so taking the sequence from the template you can be able to design the primers and these can be readily produced by the commercial company so once you design the primers so primers are nothing but the oligonucleotide sequences and that you can actually be able to use for uh, you know designing the primers and then you can give those sequences to the companies and they will give you the um, you know synthesized oligos uh, then the third is uh, thermal stable DNA polymerase, for example, tag DNA polymerase, so which is not inactivated by heating even at 95 degrees Celsius. So that is uh, what you require. And then you also require a machine which is called as uh, DNA thermal cycler, so machine which can be programmed to carry out the heating and cooling of a sample over a number of cycles. So this is what you are going to see. This is the thermal cycler from the applied biosystem. And uh, what you are going to do is uh, you see these are the these are the blocks uh, and where you can actually have the holes. So in these holes you can be able to keep your append offs or reactions. And then this is called as heating block. So these heating blocks uh, you are going to use to close the lids so that and this heating block is going to be at 100 degrees Celsius. So this actually ensure that there should be no evaporation of the material from the reaction vials. So thermal cycling is the instrument that carry out the amplification by polymerase chain reaction. The device has a thermal block. So this is a thermal block, right? What you see uh, with the holes where tubes holding the action can be done. And then the cyclers then raises the and lower the temperature of a block in a discrete pre-programmed steps. And then you have to have to set up the reactions. So as I said, you know, you are going to have the multiple components like the template DNA, you're going to have the primers, you're going to have the TNTPs, you're going to have the tag DNA polymerase, and you're also going to have the water. So you're also going to have the autoclave water, which you're going to use, right? So template DNA, if template DNA you have, you have to use as per the source of the template DNA. So for example, if it's a viral or the short templates, you can use the uh, template DNA in the range of picogram to nanogram. But if it is a genomic DNA, then you might have to use into the microgram range. Primers, you're going to have two primers, the forward primer and the reverse primer, and that you have to use in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 micromoles. Then you also require the magnesium chloride. So magnesium chloride is in the range of 1.5 to 2 millimolar. And then you also require DMTPs. DMTPs means uh, the uh, all the nucleotides. So you require a DATP, DGTP, DTTP, and DCTP. Uh, okay. So all these are going to be present into this uh, DNTPs mixture so that you can use at 200 micromolar. And then you also require the tag DNA polymerase. So tag DNA polymerase you can use at the 0.5 to 2 units for the 50 microliter reactions. And then ultimately you're going to add the water so that you can be able to make the reaction as 50 microliter. So uh, as far as the, the sequence in which you are going to add these, so you're going to first add the water, then you're going to add the buffer, then you're going to add the uh, DNTPs, you're going to add the template DNA at the end. And once you have all these reactions, you are going to set up, you're going to put that into a thermal cycler. 
and that's how it is actually going to give you the amplified product. So we have prepared a small demo actually to demonstrate you these events and um, this demo is been prepared for by um, in my laboratory by some of the students and uh, what they are going to do is they are going to show you how to set up the PCR reactions and how you can be able to perform the PCR. Hello everyone, my name is Suram Banesh, a research scholar at Department of Biosciences Bioengineering at IIT Gavati. In this video, we will show you how to set up a PCR reaction and what are the uh, precautions we have to take while setting up the reaction and uh, how to analyze the uh, PCR result using uh, uh, agarose gel electrophoresis. So let's start it. Hello everyone, in this video we will be demonstrating how to set up a PCR reaction and analyze the results using agarose gel electrophoresis. PCR or polymerase chain reaction is a widely used molecular biology technique to amplify a particular segment of DNA. It is also employed in biomedical research and forensic medicine. The main application of this polymerase chain reaction is cloning. To set up a PCR reaction, we need template DNA, site specific primers, DNTP mix, nucleus free water and tag polymerase. For a 50 microliter reaction, in a typical concentrations of 10 to 100 nanograms of template DNA used and 5 pico moles of each primer will be used. This is an earlier version of thermal cycler which contains display unit where we can observe the parameters and change the parameters. This is a hard shield, this is sample holder and inside there is a peltier system which can maintain the temperature fluctuations. For setting up a PCR reaction. Initial denaturation at 95 degrees Celsius, 3 minutes and this steps we will use 30 repeats where initial denaturation will be 30 seconds and annealing at extension extension time should be given 1 minute per kb and here final extension should be given 10 minutes and hold it 4 degrees Celsius Ten.
once the pcr reaction is completed we have to analyze the results for amplification for that we need agarose and tae buffer first we have to weigh agarose and mix with the tae buffer it will not dissolve easily so we have to heat it in microwave oven until it get dissolved now agarose got dissolved in tae buffer we have to let it cool down up to 50 degrees celsius now before pouring we have to add ethidium bromide for detection purpose now the gel got solidified we have to take out the gel and keep it in the electroporotic apparatus we have to gently remove the comb loose the knobs and keep the gel in the apparatus make sure that the buffer is submerged the gel we have to fill the remaining part with 1x tae buffer generally for analyzing the dna samples we will use agarose gel electrophoresis this is the power pack and this is the electrophoretic apparatus this is a negative electrode and this is a positive electrode we can change the voltage from here for loading up sample we have to mix pcr reaction mixture with 5x loading line the loading is over we have to cover the electroporotic apparatus with the lid and we have to adjust the voltage then start drop after the agarose gel electrophoresis we have to visualize the amplified product this is the kemi duct mp where we we are going to uh, visualize the amplified product now we have to keep the gel then close the thing we have to select here application nucleic acids ethidium bromide exposure optimal exposure 
or we can select manual also then we will acquire the images Now we can find here this is the DNA ladder, this is the PCR amplified product. We can transform it into transform or save this image into JPG or in this video we have discussed uh, how to set up a PCR reaction and uh, how to analyze the PCR result. We have also shown how to use a thermal cycler and what are the components of thermal cycler. So during all this process we have to take some precautions uh, to get a better results. Like uh, all the time you have to keep uh, polymerase engines and your primers at on ice and uh, uh, other thing we have to remember is uh, while running the agarose gel electrophoresis always wear the gloves to uh, prevent any uh, contamination with the ethidium bromide. So ethidium bromide is a carcinogen so it is not very likely to cause any cancer but we have to make sure that we are providing this kind of touching with the ethidium moment. So um, in this demo we have discussed about the different events and uh, what are the precautions you should take and all that. Now as far as the template DNA is concerned, the template DNA could be of any type. It could be genomic DNA, it could be DNA fragments, it could be plasmid, it could be viral sequences or it could be the tissue samples. Okay. Uh, so that is the uh, template DNA. So depending on the source, you can actually be able to choose the amount of template DNA what you require for the reactions. Then you also require the primers. So primers are the short DNA stretch that serve as a starting point for the DNA synthesis. In the PCR, you require the two primers, you require the forward primer and the reverse primers. And uh, primer designing is very, very crucial and uh, uh, important for achieving the best results during the PCR. So you have to design the forward primer and as well as the reverse primers uh, in such a way that they should actually uh, going to give you the best amplified product. So what are the criteria you are going to adopt when you are going to design the primer? So first is the number is primer length. So primer length can be 18 to 20 bases and it is the ideal length which is long enough for adequate specificity and the short enough for primer to bind easily to the template at the annealing temperature. Then you require the primer melting temperature so TM right. So primer with a melting temperature in the range of 50 to, uh, to 58 degrees Celsius generally gives the best results. The GC content of the sequence gives a fairy indication of the primer TM the melting temperature. The two primers should be prepared in such a way that the melting temperature differences between them should not be more than 2 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, it will result in the poor annealing efficiency. And you can be able to calculate the primer mel melting temperature uh, by using this particular formula. So if the primer is uh, having the length which is less than 14, you can use this formula. And if it, the primer is having the more than 13, then you can actually be able to use this formula. And uh, the third is the primer annealing temperature. So too high annealing temperature will provide insufficient primer template hybridizations results in the low PCR yield, while the too low annealing temperature is actually going to give you the non-specific PCR product caused by the high number of base pair matches. And you can be able to use this formula to calculate the primer annealing temperature. The fourth is you also have to take care of the GC content. The number of GCs in the primer as a percentage of total base should not be should be between 40 to 60 base pair because the GC actually is a 
having the three base pair, right? So every G is having the three base pair, three hydrogen bonding with the C, and that's why it provides a better specificity and better strength where it, for the primer to uh, anneal to the template. Then you also require to see the GC clamps. Uh, a GC clamp is formed a stronger band than 80, then the number of GC present at the three prime end of the primer should not be more than three. Otherwise, will result in a non-specific tight binding in the region where the G and C are abundant. So GC clamp is going to be formed at the end of the template and we should avoid the uh, lot of GC at the end because otherwise it's actually going to bind at the end okay and it's going to form the GC clamp. Uh, then we also have to take care of the uh, hairpin loops, dimers and the repeats okay. So hairpins are the loop structure formed by the intramolecular interaction with the primers. Optimally, a three prime end hairpin with a delta G of minus two kilocalorie and an internal hairpin with a delta G of minus three kilocalorie is tolerated generally. Okay. So if it is a having a hairpin which is having a you know a free energy in the range of minus two kilocalorie to minus three kilocalorie, it can be easily be managed because when you increase the temperature, all these hairpins are going to be broken down. Similarly, you have the dimers. A primer dimer is successfully form a double standard structure which is formed by the intramolecular interaction between the two primers. So you can have the two primers and they may have the overlapping region and that's how it is actually going to form the dimer. This means this region is not going to be available for hybridization with the template, right? And that could be crucial sometime for providing the specificity and as well as for amplifications. So if the interaction is formed between the two homologous or same sense primer, it is called self dimer, whereas interaction is formed between the two primer, it is called cross dimer or hetero dimer. Uh, optimally, uh, the delta G of 5 kilocalorie or internal self dimer with a minus 6 kilocalorie is tolerated. So if it having a minus 5 to minus 6 free energy uh, kilocalorie per mole, then it is can be broken down when you increase the temperature. Then you also have the repeats and runs and repeats are consecutive occurrence of dinucleotide whereas runs are continuously stretch of single nucleotide. A maximum number of repeats and run accepted is dinucleotide and four base pairs respectively. And then you can also have the primer template homology. So that is very, very important and it will actually lead to the non-specific binding and amplifications. So what you see is the primer secondary structures. So these are the primary structures. So for example, if this is the primer I have designed it is actually going to form the, uh, you know, the so many secondary structures which are going to be stabilized by the uh, these structures. So um, this is not correct. Okay. So what I what we have done is you have just changed a little bit sequences, and that's how you are going to broken down the uh, hairpins, and you are going to broken down the loops, and that's how it is actually. Since the delta energy is very low, and that's how it is actually going to be good. So we have prepared a small uh, demo clip where I have we have explained how you can be able to uh, design the primers and uh, student have taken uh, full care that they are actually going to first show you the manual method how you can be able to design the primers and then subsequent to that they have also shown you the automated method where you can actually be able to use the different softwares and they will actually give you the design primers. Hello everyone in this video I will show you how to design the primers and analyze them. So for designing primers, first you have to identify the region of interest, your region of interest, which you want to amplify from any vector or any sequence. So in second step, you have to identify non cutters. There are various softwares available, but we can use New England Biolabs NEB uh, Cutter version 2.0. After identifying non cutters, you have to select a suitable vector in which you want to integrate this amplified region and uh, suitable restriction sites. You will get suitable restriction sites from non cutters. After that, you can go for uh, designing forward primer. So for, for understanding purpose, I gave this sequence 
so i am using this sequence i will uh, use this sequence to design the primers and analyze the primers so this is the whole sequence but i don't want to amplify uh, whole region i want to amplify the letters uh, the sequence which is highlighted in green so i want to amplify starting from here to here so now the question arises what are the non cutters so you want to amplify this region and integrate into another vector for that you have to identify which are non cutting restriction enzymes so what i will do i will copy this sequence into uh, any b cutter and identify what are the non cutters so i just copy the sequence and paste here and i will ask submit so it will analyze the sequence and give non cutter these are the enzymes cutting inside the sequence but we are interested in which are non cutters so that means you can see here non cutters so just click here it will give Uh, number of enzymes which will non or uh, not cut inside the sequence so once getting this list we have to identify in which vector you want to uh, integrate your amplified region so for that purpose so i have selected for easy of understanding i have selected pet 23a vector so you can see this is the vector map so Uh, this is the five prime side. This is the three prime side. So, N terminal and this is the C terminal side. N terminal means forward primer. C terminal means reverse primer. So I can use BAM H one in forward primer and XH one in reverse primer. This is the detailed map. So I have identified two restriction enzymes. that is bam h1 and xh1 so i can use these enzymes in forward primer and reverse primer so after identifying restriction enzymes and uh, the vector we will go for designing forward primer so i will take this sequence i want to amplify from here to here so i will copy this sequence here so for designing forward primer it is very easy you have to take the sequence whatever you are getting up to 15 to 20 bases you can take as it is so if you want to insert a restriction enzyme suppose i want to insert a restriction enzyme this is the uh, sequence as it is given from this um, this whole sequence so i want to insert a restriction enzyme that is bam h1 so this is the uh, sequence for bam h1 here it cuts so i can use this sequence here so this is the this is our restriction enzyme here it will cut so we cannot uh, simply queue like this so there should be some more bases extra bases we have to add in the five prime side so i will use uh, so this sequence i will use so now this is 5 prime to 3 prime side so this is uh, our forward primer is ready so after designing this forward primer we have to analyze this sequence so this primer so what i will do is i just copy this sequence and i'll use aligo analyzer software which is 
specially designed for this purpose only i will paste the sequence just ask analyze so here also you can see there are uh, so many options are there like uh, you can analyze hairpin loop self dimer hetero dimer so uh, these are the general details what is the length and uh, gc content melting temperature uh, molecular weight so these are normal details i will go for hairpin loop is there any hairpin loops so we can see there are uh, number of hairpin loops uh, we can see different different uh, structures predicted by the software so if you want to explore this thing you can explore only two bases two bases it is forming and uh, the delta g value is minus 0.43 kilocalorie per mole so this is fine up to uh, minus 10 kilocalorie per mole is fine uh, those uh, hairpin loops broken uh, during the uh, during the uh, amplification process but above that above minus 10 kilocalorie per mole cannot be broken so in that case what we will do uh, either we redesign the primers or uh, we will add uh, 5% uh, 1 percentage B10 or 5 percentage DMSO these are uh, these chemicals disrupt the these loops so that uh, the amplification will be uh, fine so next I will analyze for uh, self dimer is there any self dimers uh, and what is the maximum delta G so this is uh, this is forming continuously five bases it is because of the uh, restriction sites so those are uh, restriction site uh, those uh, homodimers forming due to restriction site can be broken there is no issue but other than that this is also because of uh, uh, restriction site but other than that we have to look carefully so is there any continuously four or five bases forming this uh, homodimer then it is very difficult these interactions can be broken easily so here uh, some of the uh, consecutive base pairs are there these are very weak interactions so they can be broken so other than that uh, there is no significant um, self dimers so this sequence can be used and uh, for heterodimer predicting heterodimer you need a complementary sequence with uh, uh, reverse prime like reverse primer you need so that we will discuss later on so we got our forward primer here so it is very easy uh, to uh, generate forward primer but in case of reverse primer it is somewhat difficult because not in terms of uh, predicting things it is somewhat uh, tricky so what i'm saying is here we have sequence so in case of forward primer we just take an as t sequence 15 to 20 basis as it is from sequence it but here we have to take complementary sequence not uh, uh, 3 prime to 5 prime or 5 prime to 3 prime sequence we have to take complementary to this one say this is the sequence we got from here so what is the complementary to this one so just I will I will add here
so this is the complementary to uh, this particular sequence so as you can see this is uh, we have to keep from this direction 5 prime to 3 prime so I will take like this So, what we have to do is, we want to insert a restriction site here. So, we can insert a restriction site here uh, directly. So, in uh, reverse primer, we wanted to insert XH1 site. So, So this is the restriction site. As usual, we can use uh, we have to insert T here. So uh, this is the restriction site uh, we added. We can add flanking regions in between uh, flanking bases. Uh, before this uh, restriction site so now we got our uh, reverse primer so we have to go through same procedure like what I have shown in in case of forward fire primer so just I will copy paste here and analyze the reverse primer so is there any hairpin loops only one hairpin loop that is within the range of delta g so there is no issue and uh, self dimer so we can see here continuously four bases are forming in this case we have to either either uh, change the sequence uh, or uh, remove the some of the bases we can ignore uh, those restriction uh, those dimers forming through restriction site So next heterodimer we have to analyze for hetero heterodimer we need uh, forward primer just copy paste here and calculate it will give is there any uh, heterodimers this is because of uh, restriction site this is also because of restriction site this can be broken those which are um, at the end of the sequence they can be broken but uh, which is in middle if you, uh, the those bases are middle it is very hard to uh, disrupt those interactions and uh, our amplification will be not good so there is no amplification literally other kind of interactions will be broken easily these are weak interactions so 
this is how we can prepare uh, design the primers and analyze the primers we have done all these processes for designing uh, forward and reverse primers but instead of doing manually we can do it online we just have to submit the sequence and it will return return the uh, forward and reverse primers these are some of the tools available online for freely but there are commercial tools also available like algo 7 vector nta primer female so if you interested in these softwares uh, or you can just go through these sites and submit your sequence uh, you will get your uh, primers so primer designing is uh, is a very very crucial event because it actually provides uh, not only the um, uh, specific product but it also very very crucial for the getting the desired amplified products so after the primer you also require the enzymes so it, you can have the multiple enzymes available earlier there were only one enzyme the tag dna polymerase was available but now there are multiple enzymes which are available so you can actually be able to use the tag dna polymerase so tag dna polymerase which is which is is a microbe found in uh, which is from a microbe which is found in the 170 degree fahrenheit uh, in the yellowstone national forest tag dna polymerase is stable in high temperature and act in the presence of magnesium the optimal temperature for tag dna polymerase is 72 degrees celsius so tag dna polymerase is one of the uh, uh, standard enzyme what people use but tag dna polymerase comes up with the following disadvantages you can actually be able to get uh, you know tag dna polymerase lacks 3 pi to 5 prime exonuclease proofreading activity commonly present in other proteases other polymerases tag dna polymerase misincorporate one base in 10 to power 4 bases this means it is actually going to incorporate wrong nucleotides so instead of a it is it should in, in, uh, incorporate d but instead of in in front of a it is actually going to incorporate g or c so in that cases it's actually going to lead to the formation of the mutated genes a 400 base pair target will contain an error in the 33 percent of the molecule after 20 cycle error distribution will be random which means sometime it may actually do the mutations at uh, 32 positions sometime it will do a position at 40 uh, 400 like that so it, so it's not like the error is going to be at a very specific point it can be anywhere so to avoid this we have the alternatives you can actually be able to use the pfu dna polymerase from pyrococcus furious and it processes the 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease proofreading activity so because of that it actually even if it incorporates a mutated uh, nucleotides it will actually go and correct that the error rate is only 3.5 percent after uh, 20 cycles so more amount of primer is added to avoid uh, the primer dimering formation and for unexplored genes the primers used in closely related species are used okay so this is all about the pcr and uh, we have also discussed about the optimizations and uh, there are many way in which you can be able to do the optimization of the pcr uh, so when you perform the pcr you are actually going to face many problems like the uh, non-specific amplifications no amplification and so on so you actually have to adopt multiple um, optimization techniques to overcome that problem and optimization could be at the at, at the stage of setting up the reactions or the optimization could be even at the reaction cycle also okay and sometimes the optimization can be done for primer sequences enzymes and the additives so you can actually be able to use many of these things so in one condition if no product can be produced what are the things you can actually be able to use for uh, you know to optimize so you can actually be able to check the dna quality which means you can be able to use the uh, template the quality of the template 
you can actually be able to reduce the annealing temperature, you can increase the magnesium concentration because magnesium is a cofactor. So, magnesium is forming a complex with ATP and that is how it is actually a very, very essential for the tag DNA polymerase to perform the polymerization reactions. So, you can actually be able to vary the magnesium concentrations. Then you can also add the DMSO and uh, if you add the DMSO, it is also going to confer the specificity in the system. You can use the different thermostable enzymes and that also is going to sometime work to provide you the uh, product. And you, if any of these things does not work, then you can actually be able to design the new primers and uh, it may actually be able to work. If the second condition is that in case you are getting the non-specific uh, amplification. So, if you are getting the non-specific amplifications, um, then you have to increase the annealing temperature. If you increase the annealing temperature only the, at the point where you have the specific uh, interactions, the only those are the points it is actually going to work. You can reduce the magnesium concentration. So, you can, if you reduce the magnesium concentration, the tag DNA polymerase is not going to work optimally, and that's how it is actually going to work with those templates only where the you know the interaction is very strong. You can reduce the number of cycles. Sometimes what happens is if you are running it for 30 cycle, 40 cycle, uh, the enzymes actually you know becomes uh, you know tired or it becomes more and it becomes started making, making the non-specific products. So, in those cases you can actually reduce the cycles and you can also you start using the different enzyme like the PFU so that the there could be more specificity in the system and that is why it is actually going to give you the better amplified product. Once you are done the PCR, you are going to analyze that PCR onto an agarose gel. So, uh, analysis of the PCR, once the PCR cycle is completed, the amplified product is loaded onto the agarose gel and observed after the TDM bromide staining under the UV light. And what you see here is, this is the 1 kb ladder. This is the negatively amplified product, which means it is only going to show you the template DNA. And this is the positively amplified product, which is actually going to give you the amplified product. So, this amplified product is completely absent in the negative amplifications. So, this is uh, all about the PCR reactions and which you can actually be able to use to amplify the gene of your interest. And once you got the gene of interest, for example, here you got the gene of interest, then you can actually be able to cut this agarose block and you can be able to isolate the fragment and once you isolate the fragment, you can be able to put that into the cloning reactions or you can actually be able to put into the cloning vector and that is how you can be able to use for that for the protein production. So, this is all about the uh, PCR and how you can be able to set up the PCR, how you can be able to design the primers and so on. So, with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.